Now, I'm going to focus, as, as was mentioned, on an all-of-government approach. And I have to say I was delighted to hear Professor Stiglitz this morning talk quite at length about a coordinated strategy, because this very much underlies what in the book we think is quite imperative if indeed the extractive sector is going to realize benefit for its citizens and for the societies. So I'm going to be looking at some of the multiple domestic policies. There's a lot of silo thinking around the resource sector. So I'm looking at some of the silo thinking, how can we get that to be more joined up? So when you look at what is already out there, there's a fantastic framework already, which you're all familiar with. This follows on from the MDGs. But the interesting thing about the SDGs is that they provide opportunity for business to be engaged in delivery of the SDGs. This is a difference from, from the previous MDGs. And importantly, partnerships for development. And it's this this linking between the public, private, and communities, which again is so central to really realizing benefits. So I want to talk, give you a couple of examples which are also in the book, and it's all around an approach that was developed by the CEO-led um, International Council on Mining and Metals. And this approach was done together with UNCTAD, together with the World Bank, together with Oxford Policy Management. And it really focused on what are the tools and the approaches which will help countries and communities um, on really expanding the opportunities from what are often multi-billion dollar investments. So that work started in 2004 and we developed a toolkit which has been tested and, and applied in a number of countries. But the first bullet there is one of the early observations that came out of that work, that in fact, in many countries, there's not actually a good understanding of the full contribution to the macroeconomic in the form of FDI exports revenues. And even at the local level, jobs or employment opportunities, that information is often not readily available. And what is even less available is what's coming ahead, as Alan said, Companies are taking 20, 30, 50-year investment decisions. They have that information. Seldom do governments have that information. And this came out very starkly in Lao PDR when we were applying the toolkit there. So just prior to a workshop, the government was organizing. There was going to be about representatives from 20 different agencies, parliamentarians, civil society, aid partners, private companies. We met with the Minister of Energy um, in his office to present the draft findings of this contribution at the macro and micro level and to get his feedback before we presented the draft findings to the workshop. And this research had been done by the National Research Institute. So as they were going through the findings with him, he was looking more and more puzzled. And eventually he turned to me and he said, Catherine, he said, you worked with us in the World Bank on the hydropower sector. He said, we in Laos, we are a hydropower country. We're not a mining country. So I said, well, Mr. Minister, you are indeed a hydropower country, but these numbers are showing you that mining is very important to your foreign investment, your exports, your tax revenues, and even employment and poverty reduction, which we looked. So this is the sort of information that for policymakers, when they're thinking about the choices that need to be made, Having that sort of evidence is really helpful to, to look to see how to really enhance the, um, the opportunities. So I'm going to move on now. I know this is a really busy slide. Alan already told me this is far too busy, far too... too uh, but it, I wanted to visually give you an idea of really how many government agencies can potentially be involved in making sure that these big investments actually translate into benefits. Now, Joe Stiglitz this morning talked a lot about the resource sector governance. We don't need to go over infrastructure and community engagement. I'm going to give you an example in the next slides. Environmental protection, though, there are, as Alan's already said, IFC have got very you know, internationally recognized standards on minimizing the negative impacts. There's a lot of opportunities to, to really ex enhance the environmental aspects of these investments. But what, where I see a real gap is in uh, renewables. 
I mean, there are one billion people around the world who do not have access to electricity. So this could be integrated into the investment in an oil, gas, or mining. And it would also be a benefit for the resource companies. What people don't really often appreciate is that these companies are huge consumers of energy themselves, just in their own operations. They are consuming a huge amount of electricity. So that could potentially come from renewables, but you need to be thinking about that. The government needs to be. So, so that's, those are sort of some of the opportunities. Um, Evelyn's talked about local content. Joe talked about revenue management. This social and economic development, it really comes back to where is the long-term vision for the country and citizens to benefit. And, and it's a question of how you get that, that to, to be mobilized. So one of the real lessons that's come out of this work is collaboration is absolutely key. Of course, governments can do a lot. Companies can do a lot. NGOs and, and uh, others can do much. But if you can join up those efforts, you get much more benefits, um, both locally, which is absolutely critical, because as many of you know, the, imp the negative impacts of these investments fall at the local level. At the, at the national level, that's where the big benefits are. So there's a real disconnect between the local and the national. So let me talk a bit about um, Brazil. So Brazil, we looked at a project in Pará State. This is one of the least developed states in Brazil. It's right in the middle of the Amazon jungle. So there's a lot of the companies there have many sort of mandatory and voluntary initiatives around helping communities for infrastructure, helping access on capacity building, public administration, et cetera. But what, what really struck, struck us when we looked at Vale's operations there was how formalized they got a system going, which started out with the government's environmental licensing permit. So every company had to have an environmental licensing permit. So they took that as a starting point, but they added, they consulted with the regulator, got agreement with them, and then they did a diagnostic in all the municipalities that they were touching or working in. They did a diagnostic, socioeconomic diagnostic. So they took their own investment plans for the next 25, 30 years and worked out what that would mean in terms of needs for schools, need for better or more infrastructure, particularly if it didn't roads, very rare in that area. What sort of public services would be needed on the back of this investment that they'd already worked out for those municipalities in Pará State? They, then, they also agreed to connect up the municipalities with Brasilia. Now, if you've, if you've been to Brazil, you'll know it's a huge country. Municipalities in remote Pará state never, ever go to Brasilia. And likewise, the federal government can take a while. To, so they, they offered also to connect up the municipality concerns and issues with Brasilia. This was all formalized in a letter of agreement. These letters of agreement then set out the roles and responsibilities. What was the company going to do? What were the municipalities going to do? What was the federal government going to do? So this was all set out in these letters of agreement, which were then published. And so they could be held to account. There was some record of who was going to do what at what time frame. So this is an example where, of course, the company could have come along and said, OK, we'll invest in a road here, or the government would say, we'll contribute some schools there. But by having a diagnostic, a plan, a formalized roles and responsibilities, it really put it into a much more structured. And you know, we also looked at the poverty changes, and there were some significant changes in poverty, but I haven't time to go into that here. So. Um, this is now my last slide, and it's really about sort of bringing this all together. So coming back to what we've been hearing again from this morning is how do you go about developing this long-term vision and all of government approach? As I've mentioned, really getting the data is so important. Everybody has different perceptions of how big or, big or how small the sector is. So having the numbers which have been agreed in we, what we did in all cases was to have multi-stakeholder -sta workshops, review the draft evidence, bring in pieces that were missing, and then you've got an agreed evidence base 
to start to look at the second phase, which is what are the implications for the country of this sector? And if you've got the future scenarios for investment, which companies can provide, as I say, all companies have that, that you know, for their own investment needs, they have that, but that's often not shared with governments. So then you can start to understand, well, what, where are the opportunities for this particular country? And then what are the requirements, the sorts of things that Evelyn was touching on? And it goes way beyond the typical, you know, as I say, sort of short term, looking at the skills, infrastructure opportunities, how is the financial management, how is the transparency? So there's a whole number of issues that you can start to understand. But then bringing government people together with the companies, together with civil society. Religious groups are often very important in, in a number of countries. Having that multi-stakeholder discussion and really then having the conversation about, well, what are the strategic priorities of our country? It's not something that has been imposed from the outside. This is something that the country, the stakeholders decide. These are, these are what we want to achieve. These are the gaps. This is how we get. So then who's going to help us get there? And I, I want to say that Alan's point about the timeline, this is a real tension in these conversations because Alan mentioned that companies are taking a you know, 20, 50, 100 year. Governments, we heard a lot, it's four, five, six years. If you look at investors, what are they focusing on? Quarterly returns. Every company is, is being, you know, the, the, the investors are... Con the investment flows are extremely important, as, as Evelyn's been saying. Communities, what do they want? They want jobs, and they want them tomorrow. So their time frame is immediate. Investors are quarterly. Governments, three to five years. Companies, longer. So... Let me stop there with that key message that how can we bring these dimensions together and there are some processes to do that. Thank you.